Welcome everyone to the webinar, Agile Data Warehouse, our business intelligence, addressing the hard problems by Scott Amler. So without further delay, over to you, Scott. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, uh, good day, everybody, or good evening. Uh, I suspect most for most of you, uh, uh, my name is Scott Ambler. I'm uh, in Toronto, Canada. Uh, so I've uh, it's a little bit about me. I'm the uh, I'm a consulting methodologist for AmbiSoft. I help uh, organizations around the world to understand uh, and apply agile and agile data techniques, and uh, basically to scale and to address the hard problems that organizations are running into, uh, and particularly um, in the data space. Uh, so I've done a lot of work over the years uh, in this space. I'm gonna share some ideas today with you. Um, all proven techniques, uh, I will not share any theory. Uh, if I do share theory, I will be very clear about it when I do, uh, but I probably won't. So anyways, uh, yeah, I'm the person behind the Agile Data Method and as well as the Agile Modeling Method. And along with Mark Lines, the co-creator of the Dispen of PMI's Dispen Agile Toolkit. So what do I want, what do I want to cover today? Uh, first, I'm going to start with, uh, you know, being uh, data, being agile data, you know, agile data ways of thinking. And uh, then I'm going to, going to start, I'll define what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, what is this agile DWBI stuff? And then I'm going to focus on challenges that we're facing uh, and the solutions the, to those challenges. It's not just about, uh, you know, complaining about the problem. We actually have to fix the problems. Um, and then I'll uh, hopefully have some time for Q&A. Uh, we're also going to do, uh, I guess, as everybody else is doing, we'll also do a, a breakout session afterwards to uh, um, discuss uh, questions as well. And if it ends up that, uh, you know, as you're typing questions into the chat, if uh, we run out of time to answer questions, which we more than likely will, um, I'm also happy to uh, write up a blog or something, and then we'll, we'll share that after the, uh, after the conference. So um, agile days, agile data ways of thinking. How can, um, how should we uh, approach um, agile data work or agile database work? So the agile data method is described as a collection of philosophies. Uh, the you know the heart of the agile data method is a collection of philosophies. The first one is to look beyond data. Uh, so many data professionals like to say that data is the lifeblood of organizations, and I, that's true. I truly believe that. But there's more to people than just lifeblood. Uh, when you only have lifeblood, you have a crime scene. Uh, so the because there's also flesh and a skeleton and skin and hair and um, other good things. So we need to look beyond data. So data is important, but it's only one of many important issues. And the reason why this is important is because um, when you only consider data, you're only looking at part of the picture and you'll locally optimize your designs and your architectures and your approach um, and you'll miss usage you'll miss um, you know uh, security perhaps and, and other important aspects so we really need to look at the full picture not just data um, so we need to collaborate closely with our stakeholders with other IT professionals uh, with everybody um, and we need to work in an evolutionary manner when we do so we also need to be quality infected. I'm going to talk about data quality a fair bit today. And uh, frankly, the data community has fallen down on data, on data quality. And uh, I think it's uh, in many ways because of the traditional mindset um, that we see pervading the data community still. Um, they've missed basic techniques that, you know, you know, techniques that the Agile community takes for granted um, that we've been doing for years, like CI and CD and automated testing and refactoring. Um, so basic fundamental strategies uh, have been missed for the most part by the data community. Um, and it's because of the traditional blinders that they, they tend to wear. Uh, this is, and that's one of the reasons why the Agile data ways of thinking are important. Uh, so we need to embrace evolution uh, we will not get it right the first time. Uh, we need to uh, do architecture, do design, do requirements um, all the way through the life cycle continuously, not up front. Um, I'll talk about that for a bit as well. Um, we need to be enterprise aware. We need to do what's right for the organization, not just what's convenient for our project team. Uh, we need a fit for purpose approach. Every team is different. Every organization is different. Every person is different. Uh, one size does not fit all. So be very careful about adopting these prescriptive frameworks that 
promise you, including um, some of the more flexible ones like Scrum that, you know, promise you, you know, the world. Uh, it's simply not the case. And frankly, uh, data warehousing teams are in a much different situation than application teams. So we need to be aware of that and act accordingly. And everybody should be agile, not just uh, not just development teams. Uh, so we need to go, you know, we do, we need to apply agility across the organization, um, including within our data management group. So uh, let's talk about DW and, and BI for a bit. So Agile DW uh, BI is the act of providing um, quality information in a collaborative and evolutionary manner. And I'm highlighting three words there, quality, uh, we have to have high quality data and high quality information that's being produced by the, the data team for uh, for our stakeholders. So it's interesting. Um, I didn't get to attend many of the talks um, at the conference this week, but I have to think that uh, many of them, at least the talks that went beyond software development, were talking about uh, data driven decision making and uh, data in, or at least data informed decision making, uh, which is a great thing. Uh, but there's an assumption that we can deliver the data, the information that people need, um, the right information at the right time to the right extent in the right manner. We need quality. Um, and this, once again, is where the data community tends to fall apart. Um, so, and we need, so we need to be collaborative, uh, because our stakeholders needs change. I'm, I'm sure, you know, many of the talks you attended, they were talking about VUCA and the rate of change and all that good sort of stuff. Um, yes, uh, absolutely. So that means the data folks need to work in a similar manner. Um, we can't go off for months at a time. And to build things, uh, we you know our time frame needs to be days and hours, not weeks and months and years. So uh, just like everybody else, so we need to step up. So what are some of the hard problems? This is all you know. I've been preaching for a bit. So what what are the what are the challenges that we face in doing this? Because it's frankly easier said than done sometimes. So I put together this talk actually for a, a data conference a, a few weeks ago now, and. Uh, when I started listing the hard problems, I came up with about 20. <laughs> so um, I'm going to focus on what I believe to be the top nine. And uh, but, you know, if there are other challenges that you face, please put them in the chat and hopefully we'll be able to get to them. Uh, if not, then, like I said, I'm going to write this up for you um, and I'll share that as, share it as a blog or, or article more than likely. But anyways, uh, let's uh, let's start talking about these. Let's work through these nine problems one at a time. Uh, and they're not in any sort of order um, other than, uh, you know, my mood at the time when I put the deck together. <laughs> so call it like it is. Okay, so anyways, uh, problem, upfront architecture and, uh, you know, traditional approaches to data architecture is really the, the challenge here, the, the desire to do um, all this upfront thinking. So a couple of points that I want to make here, part of the solution. So first, um, I highly suggest, I have no, no skin in this game, by the way, um, but I highly suggest looking at Data Vault 2. If you are doing, uh, if you're a data warehousing professional, if you are involved with building a, a, a data warehouse, I highly suggest you look at Data Vault 2. Um, it, they, the, the group of people behind this, uh, particularly Dan Linstead, but certainly others as well, are practitioners. They have been out in the field uh, working in very difficult situations. Uh, Bill Inman, by the way, um, is uh, one of the father of data warehousing, is a big fan of DV2 and has been actively involved with this community. And uh, they've done a lot of architecture work for you. Uh, for at scale, uh, you, know, you know, situations where you're dealing with data at scale, incredible volumes of data, like really, really, really big data, uh, at scale and fast. So um, just an incredible amount of thinking that's been gone behind this methodology and this uh, architecture and the architecture and design patterns of Data Vault 2. So, um, and you, you ignore uh, those patterns at your peril. Um, I've seen some organizations where they think they're special, they think they can... Um, rethink some of the patterns, it always goes poorly. Um, one of the reasons why I like Data Vault 2 is uh, this is all really solidly thought out and agile stuff. 
that they're doing. Um, really, really good. Um, just do what you're told. <laughs> I mean, this this is one of the. This is actually yeah, to be clear. I am not a fan. I am not a fan at all of prescriptive methods. Um, I think they're almost always a bad idea. Uh, Data Vault Two is pretty much the only thing I've found where I would follow follow their advice to the letter. Um, and believe me, um, that is completely unusual for me. Uh, I'm not a big fan of that. But in the case of Data Vault Two, just do what you're told. <laughs> really, do what you're told. Um, when I'm uh, involved with teams that are doing uh, data warehousing, uh, one, of the, one of the things I want to do right away is what I call a data source diagram or a, a Milky Way diagram. I want to know all the system. I want to identify uh, all the potential uh, data sources that I'm probably going to be interacting with and some basic data about them. I don't need details, but I do need to know you know, hey, you know, the NC1701 database is something that we're probably going to have to uh, work with at some point in time. Here's the type of data in it. Here's who I talk to. Who's, who's here? I, this is you know, the group I need to collaborate with to get access and to work with their data. And this is how we're going to do it. Um, you know, it's a data feed. It's you know, this type of data feed type of thing. I don't need uh, a lot of details, but I do need to get an overview. I need to understand the landscape of what I'm dealing with. Um, I also want to start uh, doing some conceptual modeling. Uh, I want to identify the high-level entity types and the and where they come from. And I want to start mapping. Um, so where am I getting person data from and student data from and so on? Um, I don't need a lot of details. I don't need to know that there's 50 uh, you know, data elements um, behind students. Uh, that's sort of the details I can get later. Uh, you know, if I have, if I have the capability to identify the details now, I certainly have the the ability to do so. You know, three months from now when I actually need the data. Uh, so there's no rush for that. But I do need to understand the landscape. I need a high level overview uh, to identify this is what I'm dealing with. So I need the, a physical overview, and um, that's what the data source diagram is all about. And I need a logical overview as well. Um, so that way I can start getting into what we're doing. And then the details will come out over time as we implement vertical slices. So my models need to be just barely good enough. Now, many tra traditional people will thrash on this concept, but the, the concept is, is solid. Um, just barely good enough is the most effective place you can be. Because if something is more than good enough, if you keep investing, um, you know, working, you know, something gets to the point where it's good enough and then you keep working on it, you're, you're wasting your time. You're throwing money away, right? Um, it just needs to be good enough um, for the situation that you face. So the challenge, of course, is how do you know when it's just good enough? Because this is situational. Um, there's no hard and fast rules, which also blows the minds, the traditional folks. Um, you know, so if you want to be just told what to do, um, it doesn't work out well in the modeling world. So anyways, uh, what are the factors you need to be concerned about? Well, the things that motivate me to do more modeling, to um, invest more in an artifact, if I'm in a high risk situation, if I'm dealing with complexity, or if there's, I'm being pushed for some some sort of desire for predictability. You know, I've, I'm dealing with executives who still believe in on time and on budget and all this just nonsense of the of the management world. Um, you know, the reality is you you you, you got to deal with that, and sometimes you have to increase the risk and waste money in order to make it look as if you're working in a predictable manner. Um, but unfortunately, as we all know. Our stakeholders change their minds, the situation changes. So any sort of predictability around budget and time is, is delusional at best. But anyways, don't get me going on that topic. Um, but what motivates me to do less modeling? Well, if I'm, a, if I'm working with highly skilled people, uh, people who can gather the details later on, um, then I don't need to do as much modeling. If I have good access to my stakeholders, the people who can answer the questions, if it's easy to change, if, I'm, if I know how to refactor my databases and I, you know, it's easy to change whatever it is that I'm modeling, um, then there's less need for me to think it through up front. This is one of the reasons why traditionalists uh, think they need to model everything to the nth degree at the beginning of a project is because they don't know how to evolve a database effectively. Um, they believe it's hard, and that's um, completely false, which I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i talk about that later. Um, if there's great uncertainty, I want to do less modeling because it's going to change. So I'd be absolutely foolish 
to invest any time modeling something that I know is going to change. It's, it's just a sucker's bet. Um, and if I have a very collaborative way of working, I also need to do less modeling. So anyway, so um, this I think will be a, you know, this slide is probably uh, of interesting, uh, interesting value to you. Oh, I should have also mentioned that uh, these slides are available. Um, you can download them off the uh, Agile India site, uh, but they're also available on uh, slideshare.net. Um, so anyways, uh, you don't need to madly write this stuff. Uh, another problem, how do we deliver value every sprint? So every week or every two weeks? Um, well, you do that via vertical slicing. Um, now, vertical slicing is, is one of the standard techniques in the Agile world, um, but it's a fairly new concept in the data world. Uh, vertical slicing can be difficult without other uh, techniques uh, in the uh, in the Agile database uh, technique stack, such as uh, CI/CD and automated testing and all that sort of stuff. Things I'm going to talk about in a bit. Um, but the idea is that we deliver a little bit of value every every two weeks, every sprint. Um, now, at the very beginning of a DW project, it might be pretty slim. Um, you know, you might only be able to get one data element because the reality is. Um, you know, or you know, one or you know, a, a few uh, data elements on the very in the very first uh, on the very first sprint because there's a heck of a lot of setup work to get data out of one data source into your warehouse. You know, do the ETL stuff if you've still got to do that, um, and then finally into into a data mart or you know whatever it is that you're what, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, you know, just being able to get a few elements uh, in the first two weeks might be might be hard pressed. But if I'm several months into the effort, uh, you darn well better believe I should be able to, to deliver full reports and full reporting views and you know whatever it is you're doing to get the information into the hands of your stakeholders. I should be able to deliver true value um, every two weeks, and, and we'll talk about how to do that in a bit. So how do we how do we vertically slice the work? for data warehouses? Um, well, the answer is not user stories. <laughs> so, or it sort of is. Uh, you, what you really need is a specialization of user stories, something I call question stories. Because the goal of a data warehouse is to help people to answer questions, to make data informed decisions. So that means we are, and you know, we're answering questions. We're, you know, we're helping people to answer the questions that they have, to um, address their real needs. So our requirements artifacts should reflect that. So a question story is very similar to a user story. It's a spe specialization. So as a rule, I want to know something by a certain, almost always by a certain time frame, because of a reason. So very similar to a story, but nuanced, right? So the nature of data warehousing is different than the nature of app development. So you need to change the ways, you know, the, the ways that you approach uh, requirements in this case. So anyways, there's uh, a fair bit of a write-up on, uh, on the Agile data site about this technique. Another challenge that we face, um, and this is this is this is hard, um, can be hard, I should say. Um, we need to install the right infrastructure um, for our data warehousing. So, if you're on the first release of a data warehouse, if you you know you get some upfront work to do, right? You know, so it, you know if you're working the data warehouse that's been around for a few years, then yeah, it's pretty. You know, the infrastructure is all in place. You don't have to worry about that. But if we're at the beginning of our data warehousing journey, then we might have a fair bit of upfront work to do. So the first thing is embrace evolution. This is part of the, the mindset. Um, recognize that we don't need to do everything up front. Uh, when I'm coaching data warehousing teams, uh, I spend most of my time um, basically just yanking back uh, the traditional folks from, from the precipice and saying, well, no, no, we don't need to do that. Just stop it. You need to stop. Just, you know, we don't need all those details. We don't need it now. It's going to change anyways. Stop that. Um, you know, accept the fact that you're going to evolve. You know, whatever you deliver is going to evolve. Um, and so make it easy to evolve and uh, focus on, you know, accept the fact you're going to be doing this and uh, act accordingly. So what I tell people is we need to think about the future. This is why I do some upfront uh, modeling. And you saw that earlier, but we need to wait to act. We, we fill out the details later when we need them. We implement things when we need it. Um, doing everything up front is not the way to go. Now, having said that, sometimes the first release in a production is a bit bigger than you'd normally prefer. 
Um, so earlier I was talking about delivering vertical slices and, you know, talking about how, you know, maybe the first, you know, first few vertical slices are pretty slim. You know, it's a few data elements out of a single data source. Um, yes, you can do that, but who cares? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like one or two data elements, whoop de freak can do. Um, yeah, so it's not enough, right? So we might actually have to deliver many vertical slices. We, so we might have to do, you know, three months worth of work. Um, for the first release, because we've got some basic infrastructure work to do, and that that just takes time, because um, we just need to do the work to get the you know data elements out of multiple sources and combine them and clean them up, and then uh, put them in our data marts, for example. Um, so there's a bit of work to be done until you get enough value that's worth releasing. Now, having said that. You can do a lot less work than the traditional people think, uh, but you still have to do some work, you know, more work than, you know, the agile people would probably prefer. So, you know, you might have to do, like I said, you know, three or four months worth of solid work until you've got enough value that's up and running that's you know, worth releasing into production. Uh, but then as soon as they get to that point, get it out the door, get it, you know, start help helping people to make better decisions with the data that you can provide them as soon as possible because you need the real world feedback that you're going to get um, about what you're actually delivering and you need to act on that feedback and then deliver more vertical slices um, on a regular basis. There's also another serious uh, problem, just a, a lack of people, unfortunately. Um, just a lot. Uh, th this is this is a, a huge challenge. I've had uh, lots of interesting conversations with organizations that are um, actively trying to do agile data warehousing, and they can't find coaches. They can't find uh, people experienced in you know, so, like I said, some of the basic techniques um, that all the agile people take for granted, like automated regression testing of, of the databases in this case, uh, of database refactoring of many other, te uh, techniques. So what do we do? Well, the agile data method calls out, uh, several roles, um, all of which are important. Um, some of them are easy to, almost easy to find. You know, there are some good data scientists out there, uh, there are some good data analysts, although many of them struggle are struggle to be agile, but at least they've got the fundamental skills they need, and then we can maybe pair them up with agile people. Uh, not as many agile data engineers as we'd like, um, just due to the lack of um, agile data, ex, you know, agile data practice experience in many cases. You know, they're still traditionalists um, and so on. So, anyways, uh, so the good news is the roles and responsibilities are defined, uh, but we still need to, to fill them out. Uh, now, one of the challenges, um, one of the things I don't like about what I've done here uh, with the Agile Data roles is they are specialists, and I'm not a big fan of specialists. So um, what we need to do is take the specialists that we have and help them become generalizing specialists. And what I mean by that is have them, you know, help them become more T-skilled or, you know, it's more of a cross-skilled um, uh, thing, right? It's not just like one specialty and general knowledge. It's uh, one or more specialties plus general knowledge of uh, what of what we're doing. So the so take help these specialists become more effective. Um, the challenge with specialists is even though they've got deep skills and, and can add value, um, they tend to do their job even even when it doesn't need to be done. So they do more work than they need, uh, and they also uh, repeat the work of other specialists. Uh, so what we want, so what happens is when you have a wider range of skills, you have a better sense of when to do a certain technique and when not to, and the ability to at least be involved in it. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, though, are generalists. And so they have a very broad, you know, they have very broad but shallow knowledge. So they can lead, perhaps they can lead and manage, but they often can't do so what we really need is the best of both worlds, which is what a generalizing specialist is. Have a broad knowledge of what's going on. So that way you can interact um, and collaborate well with others, but also have a one or more specialties so you can actually be useful and do something of value. So yeah, we really need something in between here. Um, so anyways, um, uh, I'm probably preaching to the choir. You know, this is a very common concept in the Agile community. Uh, not as much in the data community. So um, just be aware of that. 
And of course, invest in your people. So get them training, get them coaching, uh, get them, you know, uh, particularly get them doing non-solo work, get them pairing up or working in, in triads, groups of three, or even mobbing. Um, this, you know, when you do collaborative non-solo work, um, this is when you learn. You This is when you pick up skills from other people and start uh, and sharing your own skills, of course, um, absolutely critical to your success. Another problem. Now, this is a bit of heresy for the scrum folks among us. Uh, sprints are too freaking slow. Uh, so the the challenge here is, OK, so let's go through a scenario. So why am I saying this? Right? Let's be fair. Um, so here we are. You know, so say we're, we're at work tomorrow or on Monday morning. And somebody comes to us, comes to us and says, hey, I need a new report or I need something changed in this report or I need, need a new piece of data. And, you know, you're working on a reasonably, you know, uh, semi-mature uh, data warehouse, at least. And you think, yeah, it's uh, th three or four hours of the work to get, you know, get you access to, the, to that new element or to write that new report up and test it and release it, right? Three to four hours of the work, no problem. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, we'll we'll write up that question story for it and we'll put it on our backlog. And because it's so high priority and because we really like you, we'll do it next sprint. But we're already one week into our two week existing sprint. So we'll do it next. We'll do it next sprint and we'll release into production. So here we are on Monday and I'm telling the person I'll get three to four hours of the work delivered three weeks from now. That's crazy, right? Can you imagine being the business person hearing that nonsense? Um, and e even even if my answer was, I'll get that three to four weeks weeks or days worth of work done and deliver, and I'll do it this, I'll fit it in this sprint somehow, and we'll release it on Friday. That's still a week to get a couple hours worth of work done. Also, doesn't sound great. Um, so we can do a lot better. So. What my advice here is, is that, yeah, I might work as, you know, uh, my first release of a data warehouse is probably going to be organized as an agile project. And so working in sprints to get the first release out, that first big chunk of bread, um, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, because you've got all, you know, you do have some infrastructure to put in place and you do have to do a little bit of work to get enough value to make it worth your while to release and all that sort of stuff. So um, working in a scrum based agile manner, um, more than likely as a project, because most of our organizations are still doing projects, um, even though they probably shouldn't be. Uh, but anyways, uh, you know, we'll organize it as a project team. But then once we get that first release out, I very, very quickly want to pivot my team and have more of a lean continuous delivery approach, where we're following a Kanban based approach where you know, or, or, you know, we pull a we pull a, a requirement, you know, a single piece of work into the team uh, one at a time, do it and move on. Right. So we have this continuous delivery. Um, so if I do have this high priority um, three hour chunk of work coming in on Monday morning, um, maybe we could actually get it done on Monday and released on Monday afternoon or Monday evening. Uh, because it's really high priority, you know, big vice president or something, and they we've got to get this work done. So um, this is the thing. So so there's two major changes here. First, we're moving away from a project based paradigm to a, a product or a continuous delivery type of a paradigm, and we're moving away from an agile approach, almost always based on Scrum, to a leaner approach, almost always based on Kanban. Okay. And this allows us to serve our stakeholders well. Now, having said that, it implies we have the skills and the environment to, to work in this more advanced manner. Um, so it might take you a while to evolve away from scrum, scrum based project approach into a lean continuous delivery approach. Um, so this is one of the, the challenges that we face as coaches. And, and this, frankly, is a a general issue, right? You know, for the agile people on the call, um, this is probably not news to you. <laughs> so, um, you know, yeah, of course, we've been doing this for years with our other teams. Well, it's the same thing with your data warehousing team. And of course, um, we also need to be realistic sometimes, um, you know, like, you know, having said that, so just because something is high priority for this one end user, doesn't mean that it's high priority for everybody else. So yes, you know, you desperately want your, your little report done. Um, but you know what, 
I got a lot of other far more important things to do first. Um, and it's going to be a few weeks until we get around to it, just because you're just, it's not as high priority as you think. Um, another strategy, and this is almost always part of the evolution to a lean continuous delivery approach, is shorten your sprints. Don't lengthen them. Never lengthen them. Um, the traditionalists will always have excuses for why they need longer sprints. They're special. Everything they do is different. The rules don't apply to them. That's just ignorant nonsense. And, and frankly, it shows uh, a lack of coaching and a lack of training in most cases. Uh, so, yeah, if your sprints are longer than two weeks, you've got a serious problem. Um, and frankly, uh, I would be looking to shorten them to at least a week. Um, I've seen a lot of actual, actually, I've seen a lot of uh, data warehousing teams get to the point where they're still working in sprints, um, but it's a one week sprint and it's not so bad. Yeah, it really, you know, telling people, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll throw it in what we release at the end of the week. That's usually pretty acceptable in most cases. Uh, so a one week sprint is, is something that I've seen a lot of teams live with, um, but yeah, like I said, I, I would prefer a lean continuous delivery approach where we're, we're, we're releasing several times a day, you know, it's ready to go, release it. Um, Cause I want to, I want to support my stakeholders as best I can. Um, now here's a big problem, right? And this is probably, you know, several of you, the, the naysayers among us, and I love those people, the skeptics um, say, well, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, a bunch of nonsense. So the reason why our sprints are so long is because it takes more than a sprint. It takes more than two weeks to do the data analytics to get to the point. Okay, yep, fair enough. Um, yeah, welcome to reality. That's the way it is, right? Sometimes you've got some very hard, uh, you know, you got some very complex data on the back end, or you got multiple sources, you get stuff that you don't understand, or you're you're trying to answer really hard questions. Um, I've worked on teams. Uh, I worked on one team a few years ago where on average, we need to do six to eight weeks of data analysis in order to understand the requirement, to understand the data sources, to answer the questions that we were being asked. Six to eight weeks on average. Uh, you, know, you know, sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more, but generally six to eight weeks. Uh, I worked on another team where it was also pretty much always six weeks Um that you know they 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 would do a push if it was taking more than six weeks they would do it you know around week four they would do a push to get it done in six weeks but anyways call it six weeks uh and that was just because the the nature of what they were doing was phenomenally complex and it took like some very smart people almost all of whom had phds six weeks to figure it out uh, was what it was so the implication of that is to do look ahead data analysis, to do, uh, sometimes people call this uh, refinement um, or grooming, um, not really. But anyways, you know, use whatever terms you want, but uh, it's really look at data analysis. So I've got to have a few, you know, one or more people with the data analysis skills working ahead of the rest of the team to do the data analysis for the question stories that we intend to implement um, in an upcoming sprint. So in this case, this example, uh, you know, even though we're in sprint at the beginning of sprint six right now, um, we know we've got, we believe we've got to implement uh, three question stories in sprint nine, almost two months from now. Uh, so we need to start um, in some cases, at least for question story B, we need to start the look ahead analysis now. Uh, you know, a couple of other, the other two stories are a little, a little easier, so they, they require less analysis, so we can start them in Sprint 7 and Sprint 8, as you can see. But we need to invest the time to do the analysis that we need to do. Uh, the challenge with this, of course, is there's a lot, of, a lot of planning overhead and things change. And also, it's not about just about Sprint 9, because we had the same problem for whatever we we're going to implement in Sprint 8 and Sprint 7 and Sprint 6 and so on. Uh, so our analysts tend to become a bottleneck really quickly. Uh, as a result. So this is one, another reason why you want to avoid uh, having data analysis uh, experts or specialists on your team. And you really want to get data analysis skills across all team members. So that way we can even out the work a little bit better. Now, the management overhead goes away um, in the continuous delivery space. You still need to do the, you still need to do the look ahead analysis. There's, you're not going to get away from that. But at least now when we're pulling a chunk of work um, one at a time into our process, into our team, then 
I'm really, you know, I can shift my mindset and I can say, well, wait a minute, the analysis is just part of the overall development work. So when I pull the work into the team, that's when I kick off. If, if the analysis is the first thing I do, which it almost always is, then um, it's just part of the overall development work. So if it takes, you know, if there's like, you know, four or five weeks of data analysis and then a, you know, a couple of days of implementation work, okay, fine. It, it is what it is, right? So the management overhead goes away, which is one of the, um, you know, big uh, parts of the religious debates of, uh, you know, the Scrum versus Kanban uh, debate. Um, and it's absolutely true. So, you know, fair enough, right? So, um, so from a management point of view, uh, the lean continuous delivery approach works a lot better, uh, just squeezes the bureaucracy out just by the nature of the way that you're working. Another common problem. Uh, we're almost uh, we're almost uh, through all the, all the challenges. Um, my product owner doesn't understand the data. Well, okay, fair enough. Uh, the data is pretty complicated. Uh, so what do we do? Well, uh, my product owner needs to collaborate closely with the other data professionals. So uh, the product owner might have to work uh, with the data scientist, with the uh, data analyst, very closely. So, and then they they start picking up, and by doing that, they start picking up the skills they need. Once again, we need generalizing specialists. Uh, a specialized product owner is probably not going to get the job done. They need to understand the domain that they're working in, um, and that and to get that understanding. It's going to take time uh, in many cases. And you know, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so involve, have active stakeholder participation. Um, this is a, a, a technique from the Agile modeling method. It's actually from extreme programming. Um, extreme programming has a, uh, a practice called on-site customer. And the idea, uh, and Agile modeling took it one step further and said, not only should you have your customers right with you to answer questions right away, but you know they know the business far better than you do, so put them to work. Um, get them actively involved in the modeling. Get them actively involved in the data analysis and to explore their own data. Um, and that might require a little bit of coaching and training as well. But it also requires you to adopt simple techniques like you know post-it notes on whiteboards and sketches on whiteboards and stuff like that. Um, you know, some of the low-code, no-code development tools as well. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity uh, for active stakeholder participation, particularly if you want to do self-serve BI, self-serve business intelligence. Um, the only way you're going to pull that off is if you involve your stakeholders and uh, coach them and train them in, in using these really great tools. Um, which are also development tools in many cases. Um, so, and of course, you need to train and coach them, and you know, move, like I said, move help them move towards being generalized and specialists who are constantly learning, constantly getting better, constantly collaborating with others. We also have another problem: uh, too much data technical debt. Uh, here's a picture of uh, fish swimming in the ocean, and they're swimming amongst garbage. Um, this is the reality in most organizations. We have significant tech, well, we have significant technical debt, but we have significant data technical debt as well. Um, and this is a bit of a blind spot for the for the agile community. Frankly, we always talk about code technical debt and architecture technical debt. Um, we don't have as many conversations about data technical debt. And frankly, the data technical debt is a bigger problem to solve. Um, and it's a nasty problem in many cases. Uh, so what's data technical debt? Well, technical debt is just poor quality, uh, poor quality stuff. Um, data technical debt is poor quality data. And it slows us down. It's expensive. Uh, it's absolutely devastating um, for all these uh, techniques and strategies where, where we talk about making data-informed decisions. Um, so, you know, a lot of the stuff around value streams and, you know, product management where, you know, we're going to make better decisions based on our incoming data. Well, if our incoming data is poor quality, we're going to make poor quality decisions because we have poor quality information. Um, garbage in, garbage out. If we're doing artificial intelligence, it's a showstopper. Once again, garbage in, garbage out. So we need to be quality infected. We need to stop tolerating poor quality data. We need to fix the data at the source. And this is what database refactoring is all about. Um, I co-wrote uh, a book a few years ago, about 15 years ago now, uh, called Refactoring Databases with Pramod uh, Sandilish, um, who's also been a speaker at this conference over the years. Um, 
And the idea with database refactoring, just like code refactoring, where we safely change the code in small steps, we do the same thing with our uh, backend data sources, including in production. So this book was written from the point of view of a database that's being accessed by 100 different systems running on 100 different platforms, owned by 100 different teams, none of which are under my control. Um, now, there's nothing special with the number 100. It could be 1,000. It could be 10,000. It could be a million. Um, it's just a large number of systems are highly coupled to my database schema. And even like, so think your customer database in your production database, your, your most important database. It's still completely and utterly trivial to evolve a production database schema if you know how you're doing it. Um, so here's a quick example. So say I want to rename a column, in this case, F name. And this is in my customer table in my product in my in my production data. Um, so if I just the problem is if I just rename it, it's going to blow up 100 systems, right? Because you got I got 100 pieces of hard coded SQL um, at least um, accessing that data. Um, and it's not just about encapsulation layers. So if the the, the programmers are among us like, well, we just need to we just need to use Hibernate. Um, yeah, that improves things, but it's not the real solution, um, and it won't work. It won't work across the board. But anyways, I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, okay, so what we do is we introduce the column we want, first name, copy the data over, and we put a trigger in place to synchronize the data because some of my systems will be accessing the old column, some will be accessing the new one. And then we give the, uh, we announce the refactoring and we give the other systems, uh, the teams of the, owning the other systems enough time, this could be months or even years, to start using the first name column. Um, and eventually we delete the old column and the trigger um, and the refactoring is complete. Now we need to do this. We need this deprecation period, this interim schema, because we can't break these hundred systems that are accessing the data. Okay. Um, so anyway, so it is possible. Uh, this is a deep topic that I spent one minute uh, overviewing. Uh, read the book. There's about 65 refactorings. We include full source code. Now there's tools to do this, don't get me wrong, but if you don't have access to tools for some strange reason, uh, as long as you've got the ability to type in code from a book, you can in fact do this yourself. Um, I, I highly suggest tools, of course, but uh, anyways, uh, this is real. Uh, so anybody tells you they can't, uh, that they can't, that it's not, not possible, can't be done, that they're special, they're not special, it can be done, um, and the grown-ups are doing it. So it is possible. Trust me. Well, don't trust me. Look into it. Um, finally, our stakeholders don't want to work with us. Uh, fair enough. They're busy people. Uh, but we've also burned our bridges in many cases. So um, a big part of the overall solution to help our, motivate our stakeholders to work with us is to start working with, uh, start delivering value more frequently. So um, move away from uh, big releases um, that are highly risky, that are almost always problematic, uh, almost always don't deliver what we want, what people want, and instead instead deliver uh, frequent value on a regular basis. So every two weeks, every week, um, every day, deliver more value. And when you start doing that, you find your stakeholders are willing to, to work with you uh, because the story of, well, you tell us my all your requirements up front and maybe we'll deliver something six to nine months from now, that's not attractive. Tell me what you want today and I'll get it out by the end of the week or the end of the day. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm happy to work with people that can do that. So of course, you know, vertically slice, uh, work on question stories and have active stakeholder participation. Be interesting to work with. So just to wrap up here, the increasing pace of change, the complexity you're dealing with, the increasing volume of data, demands nothing less than complete data agility. You have no choice. You need to work this way. Um, otherwise, you're out of luck. It's really that simple. Um, where we are now, yeah, and the rules apply to the data folks. Uh, that's, you know, that's the situation we're now in. So anyway, so thank you very much. Um, I think I'm at time. Thank you, Scott. Okay, thank you.